The following podcast is part of a certified educational activity titled Custom Care Compass, Mastering Multifactorial Clinical Decision-Making in High-Risk HR-Positive HER2-Negative Metastatic Breast Cancer. Access the entire activity and complete the post-test at peerview.com forward slash RRR860. Downloadable slides and practice aids are also available. Hello, I'm Joyce O'Shaughnessy. It's a really great pleasure to be here with you today to talk about this really excellent educational opportunity brought to us by Peerview. It's a custom care compass, and we're going to be mastering multifactorial clinical decision-making in HR-positive, HER2-negative metastatic uh, breast cancer today. And I'm very pleased to be joined by uh, Sarah Tulaney, who is Chief of Breast Medical Oncology um, and the Associate Director at the Susan Smith Center for Women's Cancer, Senior Physician at Dana-Farber Cancer Institute, um, Associate Professor Harvard Medical School in Boston. So, ha- so happy to be here with Sarah. Um, and I'm Joyce O'Shaughnessy, also a breast medical oncologist at Texas Oncology, Baylor University, and um, the Sarah Canna Research Institute, um, uh, in, and I'm based in uh, Dallas. So great pleasure to be here with everyone. So here's just a little bit more about what we're going to be talking about here today. We're going to talk about kind of gaps, unmet needs, opportunities for um, improvement. We're going to um, talk about some new data um, uh, with regard to overall survival in the first line HR positive HER2 negative metastatic uh, disease section. We're going to talk about, you know, what we know about the um, similarities and differences between the CDK four, six inhibitors, um, the various patient populations they were studied in, the efficacy data in the various um, subpopulations, and what does this mean for the real world setting, including choice of CDK4-6, as well as management of uh, toxicities. So we'll be um, able to share our thoughts. First of all, share the data. Secondly, share our thoughts. And then also, we're going to transition and also go over some of our second line endocrine therapy options, because as you know, we'd like to keep the endocrine therapy going for as long as we possibly can. We have quite a number of options now in the um, second line setting. So our goals for today is to augment knowledge and understanding of all, all the key data around the CDK4-6 inhibitors and give you the equip all of us with the skills to individualize the first line treatment You know, for selective patients. And we'll, we'll um, go ahead and have some conversation um, around that. And then how do we sequence? What do we think about in the um, second line setting. We'll also touch on shared um, decision-making with patients, adherence, persistence, as well as management of AEs. Critically important, as you know, for our patients to benefit from these very, very uh, important uh, therapies. So let's go ahead and um, start with a case. So this is a 63-year-old woman with a history of invasive carcinoma ductal of the breast, a PT2, N0, grade 3, ER 90%, PR 50%, HER2 1 plus. She has a lumpectomy. Then she has adjuvant a docetaxel a cyclophosphamide. She has breast radiation therapy. And she takes some um, her aromatase inhibitor for four years. And then she stops it because of continuous joint pain. Two years later, she has right hip pain and she's got lytic bone metastasis. And scans also show liver metastasis. Um, and she's got uh, bone disease in spine, hip, and ribs. She does have a biopsy of her liver, which does show uh, continuously a continued ERPR positivity, HER2 1 plus, and um, germline BRCA testing is negative. So please answer the polling questions related to this case and share with us via this poll what you would recommend as the first line treatment for this. So we're going to come back after we go through some of the data. We're going to come back and have some discussion about how we would approach this patient with a, just a two-year treatment-free um, interval. So I'm going to turn us over to um, Sarah at this point. She's going to take us through the uh, so the first line data. No, thank you so much, Joyce. Um, you know, I think we've been really fortunate to have so much data available to us on CDK4-6 inhibitors, where we've now seen multiple phase three trials that have been presented. 
um, looking at adding CDK4-6 inhibition to endocrine therapy for treatment of metastatic hormone receptor positive disease. And what's really pretty remarkable is across all of these trials, particularly in the first line setting, as you see here, the hazard ratios are really almost identical. Um, so hazard ratio of about 0.55, whether or not you gave palbociclib, ribociclib, or femocyclib, and you know, across these various different trials, you can see in essence, it was pretty much doubling the progression-free survival, which I think is really very remarkable. And, you know, one of the conundrums that we are seeing, though, is that the survival data isn't quite as consistent as the progression-free survival across these trials. So we saw a very robust data emerge from Mona Lisa 2, where adding ribocyclib to an aromatase inhibitor in the first-line setting did lead to a statistically significant improvement in overall survival, as you can see here, where you know, the hazard ratio is about 0.76. And you can see you know, a, a survival that's around 64 months. So that's a big deal because it does mean that women are now living more than five years from the time of diagnosis of metastatic disease and that these agents are really allowing that to happen. So we've changed the trajectory of metastatic hormone receptor positive breast cancer. But yet this is not so consistent with what we saw in Paloma 2 where we did not see a significant improvement in overall survival. And when you can look at the overall survival number, you see it's you know around 54 months. So this is different, again, than what we're seeing in Mona Lisa 2. Obviously, one should never really cross trial uh, compare. Obviously, there can be nuances in different patient populations. But I think it was pretty shocking to most of us that there was not an OS benefit in this trial when we knew adding Palbo doubled the progression-free survival. And yet, when we've looked at real-world data for palbociclib performance, we actually see that there does seem to be a survival advantage. And so, again, it, it does seem a little confusing. You know, one challenge in Paloma 2 is that during the conduct of the trial, there were actually two approvals for palbociclib that occurred. And there were patients who did come off the study and um, go on, for example, to receive palbociclib at that point commercially. Um, and many of them um, were not did not consent to follow up for survival. And so they they lost a number of people for survival data in Paloma 2. And so that has been a challenge perhaps with interpretation of that data. And maybe it could be one of the reasons we see inconsistent data between Paloma 2 and real world data. Um, but then comes uh, Monarch 3. So this is the registration study where a bemocycle was added to an aromatase inhibitor in the first line setting. And Again, what we had seen was we knew that abemocyclib did, in essence, a double progression-free survival, and we had previously seen data for survival from the second interim analysis, which showed a hazard ratio of 0.76, so really identical to that hazard ratio we saw in Mona Lisa 2. And here you can see there's a you know very striking delta about 13 months between the two arms, and so you know I, I think I was pretty blown away with the separation of these curves and really thought that the study would reach statistical significance given the very large um, difference between the two arms. And then um, at San Antonio this year, we did see the um, final overall survival analysis data. And now you see the hazard ratio is 0 0.80. And that while the overall survival is 67 months, it is not technically statistically significant. So even though, again, there's this very large 13-month delta between the two arms, it didn't reach statistical significance. And in fact, when you look at the subgroup with visceral metastases, you see this, again, very striking delta of now 15 months between the two arms. Um, you know, again, not statistically significant, but clearly very clinically meaningful. They also updated the progression-free survival data at this final OS analysis time point. And again, very consistent, this hazard ratio of 0.54 um, with what we've previously seen. But what I think is really cool is when you look at that landmark time point at around six years, actually 23% of patients on the abemocyclob arm are free of progression. And that to me is you know, really very remarkable, right? That means that about a quarter of patients who start off on a bemocyclob in the first line setting when they get to year six 
will be free of progressive disease and they'll still be on their first line therapy. And that is really a game changer compared to what we used to see was just endocrine therapy alone, where you can see it's only 4% at that six year time point. So I, I think really nice and nice to see, obviously, that it's delaying uh, time to chemotherapy by using, um, you know, CDK4-6 inhibition in the first line setting. And this is, you know, the forest plot looking at the progression-free survival data, really suggesting that all subgroups are benefiting, whether, um, you know, someone had liver metastases, was ER, i sorry, was PR positive or PR negative. It, it didn't really matter. Everyone was deriving benefit. You know, technically, you can see for people with the liver mets that the hazard ratio looks even a little bit better at point, uh, four, five. But again, um, everyone's benefiting. So I think, you know, when I saw these data, I will say I was trying to figure out why it is that this large difference in survival was not statistically significant. And, you know, it's interesting because if you look at the time point where we saw that second interim analysis for overall survival, where we said, hey, the hazard ratio looks pretty much identical to Mona Lisa 2, you know, at 0.76. I think it's important to sort of realize the nuances and the differences between the trials. So in Monarch 3, one thing to keep in mind is they did do a two-to-one randomization. And so that meant that the number of patients in their control arm is, you know, about half of what you see in Mona Lisa 2's control arm. And so it does mean they have fewer patients. The other tricky thing is when they designed their statistical analysis, they decided to split the alpha between looking at overall survival and the intent to treat population and the visceral disease population. And that also, you know, for their final analysis, it actually occurred at a later time point. So if you look, um, it was at eight years. So this is longer, for example, than in Mona Lisa 2. And obviously, as you follow people for longer and longer, people obviously can die, um, you know, from their breast cancer, they can die of other causes. Uh, and so that can present some challenges um, because those deaths, again, can occur across either arm the longer and longer you go out. And so here you see with this two to one randomization, splitting of alpha, much longer time course that we the statistical significance was lost, even though, again, the delta is still 13 months. The hazard ratio here is 0 0.80. And so I, I do wonder if some of the challenges here with statistical significance may be related to, in part, the statistical design, again, having this two-to-one randomization, having um, split the alpha, and having that OS time, uh, final analysis occur at such a later time point um, could have led to these potential differences. But nonetheless, again, I, I, you know, one thing I do keep in mind when always looking at survival is obviously you know, if a lot of people in the control arm get CDK4-6 inhibition, that can also impact survival data. And, you know, we do know about a third of the patients um, in the control arm did go on to get a CDK4-6. And obviously all the subsequent therapies people receive over time can certainly also influence survival and making this a little bit trickier with interpretation. So, you know, again, my takeaway from Monarch 3 was that even though it was not statistically significant, there is a very nu numerical, large, clinically meaningful difference, you know, over 13 month Delta and OS, and then about 15 months in the visceral disease patients. And so, you know, I, I do think again, that's a clinically meaningful survival difference. And there are some nuances towards statistical significance that I think we can see. But, you know, I think we're still also struggling with why was there no survival benefit with Palbo despite the doubling in PFS and we saw some interesting data with Palbo um, be presented at San Antonio, where, you know, we've previously had this study, the Parsifal study, which was really designed to help address the question of what's the optimal endocrine backbone to be utilized with a CDK4-6 inhibitor in the first line setting. So they looked at endocrine sensitive patients. So people who had not relapsed, for example, within a year of their AI uh, or had de novo disease, and they randomized them to get fulvestrant or an aromatase inhibitor uh, with palbociclib. And we're really looking to see if there are differences. And in fact, there was no difference in progression-free survival. And at San Antonio, we saw even longer follow-up, so Parsifal Long, with extended follow-up of this trial. And again, there was no difference in PFS or OS between the arms. 
However, when you merge all the patients um, into one arm, so all the patients, for example, from the fulvestric palbo arm and the AI palbo arm, what you're seeing is an overall survival for endocrine therapy and pelvocyclob that is very much in line with what we've seen now with Monolisa 2 and Monarch 3, which is around 65 months. Um, and so that is interesting, right? That's a lot longer than what we saw in Paloma 2. Um, and so I think that does make us wonder a little bit about this sort of outlier with the Paloma 2 data because the real world data and Parsifal Long do suggest OS that is in line with you know, Mona Lisa 2 and, and Monarch 3, at least the numerical overall survival. So again, um, just to really keep us on our toes, um, I, I think it does suggest, again, there, there can be a similar benefit with Palbo, but again, not proven in the, their randomized registration trial. And so why are we seeing all these differences, you know, emerge? Um, you know, we haven't seen survival benefit, for example, in Paloma 3, um, we haven't seen benefits of palbociclob in the adjuvant setting with Penelope B or with Pallas, and yet both Abema and Ribo also have benefit in the adjuvant setting. And so are there differences between these drugs um, that could be leading to these subtle differences that we're seeing in results from the clinical trials? And we do see that, you know, there are some differences in mechanism. So while these are all CDK4-6 inhibitors, their ratio of inhibition of CDK4 to 6 is a little different across these various um, drugs, where you see, for example, with uh, Abema and Ribo, there's a lot more potent inhibition of 4 relative to 6, but a little more equipotent with palpocyclib. You can also see the extent of cyclin inhibition is a bit broader with Abema cyclob, where you do get a little bit of hitting of CDK1, CDK2, and CDK9, for example. Um, so you know, again, a, a little differences that may be subtle uh, in terms of their mechanisms of action. And, and could it be that these subtle differences could play a role in their overall efficacy? I think something we don't entirely know. So Joyce, I'll, I'll pass it back to you uh, to kind of guide us through how to think about all these data. Talking to a couple of, um, you know, high-level statisticians at um, San Antonio about the Monarch 3 design, um, what I, what I heard from the experts is that probably more than anything, um, what made a difference in terms of the statistical analysis was that um, it was a smaller sample size, first of all, of the first line trials that was the smallest. Um, you need events. You need events. It's event-driven analysis for survival. You've got to have events for your final survival. And the smaller the sample size, the longer it takes you to get those events, meaning, meaning deaths, right? And then secondly, with a two-to-one randomization, um, most of your events are going to come from the control arm, but your control arms half the, it's small. It's it's only half the size, and so you're again it slows down the accumulation of events. And so they didn't have enough events to look at um, overall survival till they got to eight years, and that's longer than the other studies. Now, why is that an issue? Well, because it gives people a lot of time to cross over uh, from the control arm and get one or two CDK4 or six inhibitors down the road, but also on both arms, there's going to be a myriad of different um, therapies that the patient will will get. And we know that the, the upfront studies when patients live a long time is very, very difficult to show survival if you're really looking a lot of time later because so much intervening therapy goes on. So more than anything, it was the um, was the, the number of events was event driven and you had to just wait, you know, for the um, for the events. So that's how. And to me, that makes some sense. I mean, to me, the the um, absolute difference in survival is what matters uh, to me. The, and also, I mean, the study met its primary endpoint, right? And so, and then the delta is really good. So, I I get the analysis as like you said as well, splitting the alpha smaller sample size, um, et cetera. So, um, you know, I I get that. So it to me, it doesn't change the way I um, look at um, this. And um, I'll tell you in a second. We're going to come back to our patient here in a minute, and and um, talk about what we would recommend for this particular um, patient. So I'll, I'll mention at that time how I kind of parse out, you know, who to recommend what to. Now, with regard to Parsifal, I must say, I was encouraged by Parsifal. You know, um, both both arms of the study were kind of like spot on, you know what I mean? And so, um, you know, the Paloma 2 just never really made sense, you know, and, um, um, and so I'm encouraged to see this. It goes along, like you said, with the real world evidence. So to me, this kind of elevates, 
elevates um, Calbo up again as a choice. You know, it kind of had been downgraded as a choice. It elevates it up as a choice in my mind. You know what I mean? Because I, you know, and so because that was a well done study. You know, the the uh, Parsifal frontline. Now these are endocrine therapy sensitive patients. We want to remember it's endocrine therapy sensitive patients. Um, but you know, I I thought that was some um, good news for patients. I think it gives us some. Um, you know, kind of another option, you know, for these um, patients. So let's go back to this patient now. She had a, um, a T2 and 0 ER positive. She had TC, chemo. She took AI four years, stopped, and two years later, she's got bone and liver uh, metastasis. And here's the key for me. If I think the patient's likely to have a decent chance of being endocrine therapy sensitive, then I've been recommending um, ribocyclic but if I have a patient with more virulent disease who's kind of manifest um, endocrine therapy resistance, you know, a, um, a you know short treatment-free interval, you know, highly proliferative disease, a lot of disease, um, you know, grade three, PR negative, um, all of these severe factors that point towards endocrine therapy itself not working very well, then then I want to pair it with a the most a potent of the CDK4, six inhibitors, and abemocyclib is the most potent. Again, CDK4, you don't have to stop it. You don't, to, you, you don't take a week off. And also, it's got a broader mechanism of action. It gets some CDK2, which I think is important. That's an, a, not an uncommon mechanism of escape. To, um, and when you've got a lot of um, aggressive cancer, clonal heterogeneity, you've got a lot of different subclones there. It, to me, it's just better to go in with a broader-based mechanism of action. So that's what I do when, when patients are in a more severe disease in the in the first line um, setting, this particular patient, uh, she she doesn't sound necessarily that severe to me. Um, you know, um, you know she's recurred, and this is a patient I'd have equipoise. Um, you know, like I said, I I I'd probably recommend the um, ribocyclib to her, um, but I'd be okay with the bema. And I'll tell you, um, uh, I I for palbocyclib for patients who um, have very minimal disease, minimal, they have like really no pain from the disease, you know, and they're the, maintaining that quality of life is paramount for those patients. And some patients say, hey, doc, I'm only going to take this medicine if, if there's no side effects, basically, or patients who have a, a significant cardiac history, polypharmacy around cardiac, et cetera, um, any, any kind of, you know, history of conduction system abnormalities, then that I would um, favor a palbo or an abema, depending if I thought the patient was endocrine therapy sensitive versus not. So, that's how I parse it out. Um, I will say that the premenopausal women in general, I use the ribocyclic because of the Mona Lisa 7. However, if she's got severe disease and I'm worried the endocrine therapy is not an endocrine therapy sensitive cancer, then, I'll, then I will um, I will recommend the abemocyclib um, as well to her. What do you do, Sarah? How do you parse this out? And for, like this patient here, what would you do? Yeah, you know, I, I think um, as you were just alluding to, it's so critical to make sure that we do have important conversations with our patients so they're aware of all the the choices that we have. But you know, I think thinking about specific scenarios in which drug we would choose, um, you know, I think you know, as we were talking about, if someone has very rapidly progressive liver metastases, you know, I think probably a bemocyclib would be our choice. If someone has primary endocrine resistance, I think, again, more of a bad actor, maybe a bema. Same with visceral crisis, premenopausal, I think ribocyclib, comorbidities, maybe sometimes more in the way of palbo. Um, and so I think all these things are, are things that we do think about. But, you know, I think it is a process where we do have to have a conversation with the patient. Um, you know, as you pointed out, it is interesting when patients think about this, they're weighing efficacy at the top, but they do want to balance it with toxicity. And so letting patients be aware that there are choices and that there are differences in side effect profiles, you know, maybe some very subtle differences in efficacy, um, you know, is, is important um, to, to make a final decision. Thank you. Thanks so um, much, uh, Sarah. So I'm going to go on and kind of talk about some of the adverse events and how we manage adverse events and improving um, treatment adherence in the, um, the first line setting. So we'll go back to our, our patient here. Now, she, she received um, fulvestrant and abemocyclib, and she responded well, but then she developed grade two uh, di diarrhea, and she took a break from therapy because she had a lot of travel uh, to do the diarrhea improved off treatment. Then she restarted therapy, and the symptoms have um, uh, gotten worse again. So Please answer 
the polling questions related to this case. Again, share with us what you would do with um, this patient, given the um, toxicity that she's um, having. Clearly, it is um, drug uh, related. So please go ahead and share with us um, your, what your thoughts uh, would be. So this slide just um, gives us a nice summary of the main toxicities of the three CDK4-6 inhibitors that are across the top there. And you know we know with palbociclib in the red, it is grade three, four neutropenia. We know with abemocyclib in the red there, it is diarrhea, um, grade three toxicity, 9.5%. Uh, and then uh, grade, and then ribocyclib we see over on the right, again, it's neutropenia. And there's less neutropenia. So again, for different patients, there are certain patients we need to avoid neutropenia on, you know, for example. Um, so these are just some um, there are patients we need to avoid diarrhea uh, on, you know, for example. So that's the main toxicity that we deal with with um, uh, with the um, abemocyclib. So we're going to go ahead and start um, uh, there. And this is a an algorithm for the management of diarrhea. I'm going to, you know, orient you towards it, but you can download it as one of those practice aid tools. We'll show you that website again. Um, at the end, so you can it, you can download this and share it with patients, share it with your um, your team. It's nice to have something hard copy to to give to the patients. So, at the first sign of loose stools, I do encourage patients to start the antidiarrheal, start the loperamide. I ask them to keep track how many loperamide they're taking, how many loose stools. Definitely increase the oral fluid. Now, if it's um less than four stools above their baseline. You know, usually um, PRN, loperamide will do. With with regard to abemocyclic, eating a bland diet, not a lot of not a lot of fiber, so raw fruits and vegetables, and and not um, uh, heavy fatty meals or spicy meals, so blander for the first four to six weeks helps a lot. Grade two is four to six loose stools over baseline, and um, essentially, if it's persistent, we've got to hold the um, the abemocyclic, and then. And when it resolves down to grade one or less, if it is been persistent, it just wouldn't stop or it recurred, we do need to go down the dose. And certainly for grade three and grade four, thankfully, was extremely rarely uh, seen. Um, but for grade three, uh, which is seven or more loose stools above baseline, we have to, and I tell the patients, stop. If you get, you know, more than, a, you know, if you take several um, loperamide and you can't get the diarrhea to stop or you, you know, it's really getting, uh, severe, you just immediately stop. You don't call for permission. You stop, and then um, we'll, we'll we will help guide you here. So women just need to be empowered to to stop. We certainly need to wait until it's um stopped, and then and, and I usually will check for other you know other uh, t uh, other causes of diarrhea as well, just to make sure there's nothing else. It could be like an antibiotic and C difficile, etc. And then we we certainly have to do a um dose uh, reduction um at that point. Now, fortunately, and this is a, ni a nice slide from. Monarch two and Monarch three, the two first and second line metastatic trials with the bemocyclib in patients who um, started at 150 had to get down to um, 100, or if they had to get down to 50 milligrams in both trials, extremely reassuring. Look at those point estimates right on one in terms of effectiveness here. So this is just terrific. This is um, progression-free survival. We can really reassure patients that no, we want a dose to reduce because we want you to be able to benefit from the medication, not have to come off of it, um, essentially. And so this was very interesting. This was a kind of an important national initiative called the Patient-Centered Dosing Initiative. You know, a lot of our, our new agents are approved on the basis of the maximum tolerated dose. And now the FDA has required through the Optimus Project, they want more information on the optimal dose before going into phase three. But historically, that was not the case. And um, so sometimes we'd, we'd be overdosing uh, some patients. And it turned out they, there was a national survey of patients with metastatic breast cancer, 1,200 patients and, and 119 uh, oncologists. And they're quite a nice um, uh, surveys. And um, the bottom line was that the degree of toxicity that patients actually had was probably a bit more than was actually reported in clinical trials. Makes sense. These are real world patients with more in the way of um, comorbidities. More patients had to go to the emergency room or have hospitalization. This is in general. This is not just CDK4 or 6s. This is across uh, the board. And um, 
that so it was a bit more and the bottom line was that um these were important they they resulted in mistreatments or or stopping the agent uh, prematurely before a progression and so it this it emphasizes the importance of patient centered dose discussions as part of the routine care and i think that what we're coming to is in the metastatic setting we want patients to stay on the therapy particularly if it's benefiting them and we're learning from study after study after study that you know dose modification going down the dose if patients started at the full dose and were benefiting they have to get down the dose they did not lose their benefit so back to our patient okay so our patient really is not able to tolerate the full dose that we started her um off on so sarah how are you educating? What are you telling patients before they um, start? What's your follow-up to see them? You know, you were one of your uh, other providers you work with. Um, how? What do, what do you monitor when they um, come in? Like this patient here, what kind of a schedule should she be um, on? How would you manage um, the diarrhea um, in her case? Uh, would you consider dose reduction? What, how would you talk to the patient um, about it? And um, is there anything special you guys do with regard to adherence or or persistent. So, yeah. So, what do you what do you think, there, Sarah? Yeah, I know all very important questions. So, generally, if someone's starting a bemacyclob, I usually bring them back in every two weeks for the first two months. So, we actually do have them see us in clinic, not just get labs and locally and send them in, uh, because we do really want to make sure we're seeing them to to get an assessment also of their symptoms and how they're doing. Um, I do warn them up front, though, about the potential toxicities. You know, one thing, the abemacyclob does come with lopiramide, and so they have it on hand as needed, and we instruct them on how to use it. But we also instruct them to call us. So we don't want them waiting, for example, until their two-week appointment if they're having issues. You know, median time to onset of diarrhea with abemacyclob is about eight days, and so it will happen before your visit at that two-week mark. So very important that they're aware uh, and that then can use lopiramide as needed. But if they're having a lot of persistent diarrhea despite as needed lopiramide, I, I do hold the drug and I kind of see how long it takes also for it to get better. If it's like better within 24 hours, then sometimes you can restart at the, the same dose. But if it's taking time to resolve, then I usually do start them with the dose modification. So going from 150 to 100, it was very nice that you showed the data that suggested it didn't really matter in terms of efficacy if they dose modified. But I will say it makes a big difference in terms of tolerability. And so, you know, I, I do think it, it is important because I think people are able to um, stay on drug with less interruptions if, if that's the case. Um, you know, when we are seeing these patients, we're checking a, a CBC and a comprehensive metabolic panel. You know, obviously, BEMA, well, not quite as common, can cause a little bit of neutropenia uh, and important to monitor that. And some tricks to be aware of is that it can sometimes make your creatinine go up. And it's not that it's usually actually causing any renal toxicity, but it's impairing creatinine excretion through the renal tubules. And so that number falsely looks elevated. And I think that sometimes gets us concerned. Obviously, if someone's having diarrhea, they could be pre-renal too. And so you can send a cystatin C and that will give you the GFR and that will um, sort of remove the issue about the creatinine excretion being impaired. And so you'll get a true GFR with the cystatin C measurement. So sometimes I do that if I'm ever concerned if, you know, what the reason is for why their creatinine is elevated. And then you should also be looking, um, sometimes you can get slight elevation LFTs with a bemacyclob. And so important to check that as well, again, every two weeks for the first two months. In this case, the patient's on fulvestrant, uh, so they'll be coming in every two weeks for that first month to get loaded and then go on to, to monthly visits anyway for the I completely and utterly um, do exactly the same thing, uh, Sarah. Uh, you know, and the only other thing I would add is I, I do warn people maybe, you know, uh, low single digits, 5% or less, will have grade three diarrhea, you know, and initially. And um, that, that means it's very difficult to get out of the bathroom. If that happens, you don't take your next pill. You just call. You stop. And I, I have to tell people because I've had people not stop. And so I, I'm very explicit um, about that. Um, and I will, the only other thing I'll say is that I, for, for, the, for the very elderly, a lot of comorbidities or patients who are a little bit frail and very risk averse and not in terms of um, toxicity, there's a group, Sarah, that I'll start at 100 milligrams twice a day um, just because they're at risk. 
they're at risk for 150. And sometimes gals will just refuse to take it, you know, any anymore if they really have a bad um, a bad time of it. So because I totally agree. When you go down 100, it makes a big difference. Whatever toxicity you had at 150 is way better at um, at 100. So and then, um, hey, I was great. I was good to be reminded that 50 milligram data too. That looked that looked equally good. I've had to, not that many, not that many, but I've had a few that had to get down to 50. And I must say they they didn't lose their their benefit. So I think the key is having the patient stay on them. Now that adherence, if we're seeing them every two weeks, that they get it, they get it. We're kind of invested in this therapy working working uh, for uh, them. So let me just um, uh, talk about other toxicities with um, some of the other CDK four six inhibitors. You know, the Amelie trial was a frontline trial, the metastatic setting between the standard 600 milligrams of um, uh, ribocyclob versus 400 uh, milligrams. Um, and basically what was found here indeed that um, there was less in the way of neutropenia, there was less in the way of QTC prolongation. Interestingly, there was not less in the way of uh, liver toxicity. So again, we just need to monitor um, with ribocyclob every two weeks for two months, the same thing. And uh, patients still take the 400, you know, three weeks on, one week uh, off. But um, interestingly, the progression-free survival was spot on the same between these two. The um, primary endpoint had been response rate and the lower limits of the 95% confidence intervals didn't quite make the statistical plan, but the PFS curves were right on top of each other. So to me, these are um, these are equivalent. Um, but I do start with 400 for the most part. But if I have a frail patient, I am simply not afraid to start with 400 in the metastatic setting. Of course, that's what we're doing in the um, adjuvant setting. We don't have FDA approval yet, but we in, our, in the Natalie trial, that's certainly what we were, um, were doing. So hematologic toxicity, ILD, hematologic um, toxicity. The bottom line is persistent grade three. So less than a thousand on the neutrophils, persistent. Um, we, need, we need to hold and we need to let the patients um, recover. And then the package insert does um, recommend a dose reduction. Um, you, know, I, you know, I don't always do that if it's 900, 800 and they're doing fine. I don't, but if it's really getting down closer to grade four, neutropenia, I do I do that. Now, ILD, we don't see this very much. With all of these, um, this is a class effect. It's very, very uncommon. It tends to be low grade. We just have to be aware it can happen if it's people are coughing, short of breath for reasons we have no idea about. We certainly want to get that chest CT as we would for some of our other agents that cause um, ILD. Again, we'd stop. We'd give some steroids. We'd get the patient with a pulmonologist. We just want to be aware that this is seen at a very, very low incidence with the um, CDK4-6 inhibitors. Now, hepatobiliary toxicity, this is really an issue mainly with ribocyclib, um, and to lesser with um, abemocyclib and even lesser with um, a palbocyclib, but we just have to monitor. We have to monitor very clear algorithms here. You get grade two elevation of the liver function test. You hold it until patient's down to less than grade uh, two, and um, then a choice, either um, go down on the dose or resume. I agree with you, Sarah. If it takes quite a while to resolve, I think, okay, we'll just uh, go down on the dose. Um, but um, but there is the option. It was more mild and rapidly reversible to um, say the same dose. Grade three, we're going down on the dose. We're holding, we're recovering, we're going down on the dose. And then grade four, we're discontinuing uh, basically for hepatobiliary toxicity. QTC, this is an issue with ribocyclob. It's a very low, it's a very low chance of the um, issue. We just have to be aware that some of our patients have polypharmacy because of other medical problems or you know, they're on methadone or, you know, higher doses of the SSRIs, et cetera. Um, so we just want to be aware that we should get um, uh, EKGs at baseline and then at two weeks and then at, uh, two weeks later, at four weeks, and just measure that QTC. I, you know, I so rarely, rarely uh, see this, but um, it is something, it's, it's a peak dose effect, so a dose reduction. If you're in the metastatic setting, you can get down from 600 to 400, and it basically essentially goes uh, away. So it's a very, very uh, low, uh, low incidence. So that kind of summarizes there some of the new data and some of the approaches that we can take in that first line setting there, Sarah. So let's turn to the, um, uh, you know, really the quite numerous options and growing that we have in the second line. So maybe you could take us through some of the data that we can kind of talk about, you know, how we apply this, you know? 
Yeah, I know you're right. There are lots and lots of choices here. So, you know, if we went back to our case and we said that um, our patient developed progression after being on uh, a bemocycline full vestered for 18 months and we were left with this question, what do we do next? It isn't actually such a straightforward answer. Um, so we've seen data about whether or not we should continue a CDK4-6 inhibitor beyond progression from a few trials now. Um, the maintained study took patients and randomized them after progression on endocrine therapy and CDK to switch their endocrine backbone. So if they were on an AI, they switched to fulvestrin. If they're on fulvestrin, they switched to an AI and to put them on ribocyclob or placebo. The vast majority of patients in this study had been on palbocyclob as their first CDK. So in essence, for the majority of patients in this trial, they were also swapping the CDK4-6 inhibitor. And what they found was that those patients who got ribocyclob in this second line setting, in essence, had a longer progression-free survival than those people who just got endocrine therapy alone without the continuation of CDK4-6 inhibition. And so that made us wonder, you know, this is a randomized phase two. It's not a huge study. It's not definitive, but it did suggest that there's a group of patients who may be benefiting from this idea of swapping the endocrine backbone and continuing a CDK4-6 inhibitor, although in this case, they, in most people here, did also switch their CDK. However, when we look at trials that actually went on to give palbocyclob as the next CDK4-6 inhibitor, such as PACE and Palmyra, we actually didn't see a benefit from this strategy. So in PACE, what they did is they took patients who were progressing on their endocrine therapy, in this case in AI and in CDK, where the most people got palbocyclob up front, but here now they're going on to get palbocyclob at time of progression. So they're not really switching the CDK4-6 inhibitor for most people, but they did switch their endocrine backbone, meaning they went from AI to fulvestrant. So they were randomized to get fulvestrant with or without palbo or to a third arm where they got fulvestrant palbo avelumab. That was more of an exploratory analysis to look at the triplet. The primary analysis was to really compare fulvestrant versus fulvestrant and um, palbo. And here you see no difference between fulvestrant and fulvestrant palbo. The PFS is really the same. Um, however, the triplet combination looked intriguing uh, with the longer PFS. And there is a lot of robust preclinical data to suggest that there may be synergistic activity between CDK4-6 and immunotherapy, um, which, you know, again, in this exploratory analysis suggests maybe that's the case. The challenge that we've had is that um, to date, most immunotherapy combinations with CDK4-6 inhibition have been pretty toxic. Um, for example, with the bemocycle and Pembro, we saw high rates of hepatitis and pneumonitis. With the Valumab in this trial, though, they didn't see that. And, and maybe that's just due to the PDL1 uh, being utilized. But nonetheless, this did not show benefit to continuation of CDK4. And this Palmyra study also didn't show benefit. So, again, here going from endocrine therapy um, palbo to endocrine therapy, a different backbone in palbo, and you see again, no benefit. So I think it's a little bit confusing to know if it should be standard of care. I mean, we've seen a case series of abemocycla being used post prior CDK, where most prior CDK was palbo. And interestingly, the PFS in that case series was a little over five months, just like the maintained study, suggesting maybe there is a benefit towards abema post other CDKs. And so we will get more definitive data that will come out from post-Monarch. This study has completed accrual where it did take patients who had progressed on a CDK that wasn't Abema in essence though, and went on to get fulvestrant placebo or fulvestrant Abema. And so this will really address this question in a large randomized study and will tell us um, if using Abema post-progression on CDK with a different endocrine backbone has benefit. And so that, that will be very important data to have from a large, well-powered study. We'll also have data from Ember-3. This trial has also completed accrual, which is looking at imlanestrin, so the Lily oral SIRD, and comparing it to endocrine therapy of choice, in this case, exemestane or fulvestrin. So that's the primary analysis. But then they will also compare next imlanestrin to imlanestrin to BEMA. 
They're going to look at these analyses in the ITT population as well as the ESR1 mutant population. So we'll have to see what, what happens. But it could potentially end up suggesting maybe that even a third CDK could be an option on someone who's progressed on a prior CDK. And so this could be really interesting. Um, so I think this question about continuation of CDK46 inhibition beyond progression isn't yet definitively answered, but these two studies um, hopefully will get us there. Besides the idea of continuing CDK4 beyond progression, though, there are a bunch of other agents that have come out. Um, and so I think it's been an exciting uh, couple years, actually, to see so much progress being made. So she received a bemacyclib and the um, fulvestrant, or uh, sorry, the aromatase inhibitor in the um, first line setting had 18 months progression-free survival. And now she's got a symptomatic progression in bone as well as 1.5 centimeter new liver uh, metastasis. So she has developed um, progression in progression in the liver um, as well as in the um, bone. So let's just talk about what we might um, offer her for treatment and how do we weave in um, uh, you know, genomic testing uh, for these very important alterations. And how would you think about what to offer her, uh, Sarah? Yeah, you know, it's so complicated because we have so many choices, which is a good thing. But I think as you were alluding to, it's really critical to get genomic information to make this decision. And so usually when someone progresses on a CDK4-6 inhibitor and endocrine therapy, I usually do get a ctDNA just like you were recommending because I want to know at that time point, have they acquired ESR1? We see about 30 to 40% of patients usually have and I want to know their P3 kinase pathway alteration status. And so let's say uh, the patient comes back with an ESR1 mutation, then they could be a candidate for elicesterant if they have a P3 kinase pathway alteration, so P3K, PK, AKT, or P10. I, I do think about endocrine therapy and kepivacertib now that we have the Capitello uh, data with you know improvements in PFS. I'll say I, I haven't been using quite as much alpha-lisib, um, you know, because of the toxicity profile. And so having kepivacertib as an alternative to alpha -lisib I think is really nice. And I think I would sway a little bit if someone had a PI3K mutation towards kepivacertib potentially over alpha -lisib in that setting. I think where it gets tricky is what if they've got both? <laughs> what if they're uh, PI3K mutant and ESR1 mutant, then what do you choose? And you know, I don't think there's a wrong or right answer here. One can think about sequencing therapies too. You know, you could give elicesterate now and then another endocrine therapy and, and capivisertib next or vice versa. You know, we saw the data at San Antonio that suggested the PFS in the people with prolonged benefit to CDK and where PI3K altered um, and had ESR1 seemed to, to do similarly to the ESR1 mutant population. But I will say we have to be cautious about these data. It's like, you know, multiple subgroups of subgroups without with tiny numbers and not pre-planned analyses. But, you know, in general, if you had that patient, I think it would be OK to think about, um, you know, either option and trying to sequence them. But, you know, you do start to run out of endocrine therapy backbones because this patient's, for, you know, um, you know, if they, for example, already got fulvestrant. And someone's maybe, in this case, she didn't progress directly in on an AI, but she, if she had, you know, then you, you're starting to get into trouble with lots of choices for endocrine backbone. And sometimes I'm recycling fulvestrant in that case to give kepivacertib. So it is it, it is a little tricky. Um, how do you think about it, Joyce, with all these choices? Do you have a clear um, path uh, in your head? <laughs> uh, well, I, I, I again, uh, really totally agree with you. Um, in her case, you know, she... I'm assuming she's got normal liver function test. She, we are told she's asymptomatic. This might be a good time to give her an um, elicesterone if she's got an ESR1 mutation, even if she's got um, a, a concomitant PIK3CA mutation. On the other hand, if, if a woman was having more virulent disease, you know, more liver disease, very painful bone metastasis, you know, abnormal liver function, I would lean towards the, and I agree with you, Capivacertib plus um, the uh, fulvestrin. And, um, and then even if she had an ESR1, then I would, if she gets a nice result, um, sometimes these cancers, if you, you know, do a good job inhibiting BPS3 kinase pathway, they can escape through the estrogen receptor. So if she still had ESR1, 
uh, mutations in her in her blood after progressing on fulvestrin cappy i would offer her a um elicestrin then but my tendency is to try to match the severity of the treatment a little bit with the severity of the disease in terms of symptoms so i probably would lean towards the elicestrin if she had an esr1 um mutation and then you know if she did not have um any of uh, any of these alterations um you know i don't tend to use the Everolimus um, in patients with liver metastasis. Myself, I just have had not had good luck with exemestane and Everolimus uh, immediately upon progression on a CDK4-6 um, inhibitor. So in that case, I would lean towards um, uh, cape, cape cytobine uh, myself. But I try to stick with the endocrine therapies for as long as possible, look forward to the post-monarch data and to the Ember, Ember-3 data um, as, as well. So, Sarah, this brings us to the um, end of our, you know, uh, our the treatise here that we've uh, put together for HR positive metastatic um, breast cancer. Maybe you could just um, give us a, give, kind of give us a, a summary overview of this um, algorithm. Well, it's very simple. <laughs> <laughs> so clearly this is getting more, <laughs> more complicated as we get so many choices. So, you know, in my mind, I do think the one simple thing is you should give a CDK4-6 inhibitor and endocrine therapy as your first treatment. I, I do really feel strongly that, you know, seeing that there is survival benefits, I do like to use it up front. I know we've seen some data from Sonia, um, but I will say that I, I don't quite feel confident in a delay of CDK4-6 based on that trial. It was not designed for non-inferiority, and so I think we have to be cautious. So I would say give someone an endocrine therapy and CDK4-6 up front, then check their genomics upon progression and then use that information to help make a choice. And Joyce, as you very nicely said, I think you do have to integrate some of the clinical characteristics with the genomic characteristics to make an assessment of what to do. So, you know, how long were they on their upfront therapy with endocrine therapy and CDK4-6? Do they seem super endocrine resistant or super endocrine sensitive? Because I think that also helps give you a feeling for what you feel comfortable with utilizing second line. You know, again, with alicestrant, if they're ESR1 mutant and they did really well on their upfront therapy, that's someone where you may be okay trying an endocrine agent by itself like alicestrant. But otherwise, you know, I think you do need to understand if they have a PI3 kinase pathway alteration. And if they've got anything in that pathway altered, I typically would think about using fulvestrant capovisertib. Obviously, it just recently got approved and we're just all getting, you know, our we just were able to start prescribing this last week. So, uh, you know, I'm excited to be able to use this more now, but um, that will be a very nice option. If they don't have an alt pathway alteration, I do typically use Everolimus, um, for example, with fulvestrin to prone progression. We do have data from precog supporting that fulvestrin backbone. I tend to like that a little more than exemestane, just since so many people do acquire ESR1 after having had a prior AI. So I, I like to switch to a CERD backbone there. Uh, and then very important to make sure patients have all had germline, germline genetic testing because we do have PARP inhibition. And where we fit that PARP inhibitor in, you know, I like to make sure I give it before I've moved on to chemotherapy because these are oral agents well tolerated, associated with PFS benefit and so good to integrate in along the way. And whether or not you can give two endocrine lines or three, I think is just so dependent on how they do with that second endocrine-based therapy. If they rapidly run through it, then I, I am usually moving to chemo. If they bought a lot of time off that second line, then I do try another one. So for example, if I you know, gave elicesterant, but they've got a pathway alteration, maybe then I move on to endocrine therapy and you know, capivacertib. Uh, or endocrine therapy and everolimus or something like that subsequently. So I think, again, you got to combine your clinical judgment with these genomic uh, pieces of information. Awesome. That was beautiful. That was beautiful. And then after that, unfortunately, we have to transition to cytotoxic therapy. Um, right now we have um, sasituzumab and um, we have TDXD, trastuzumab and They both have a survival advantage over a uh, standard of care monotherapy, cytotoxic monotherapy. Um, they both require one prior cytotoxic agent in the metastatic setting. A lot of us will use um, Cape Cytobine. Obviously, the TDXD is for the HER2 low patients, and sasituzumab is for the HER2 zero patients. And we don't know if we can use them uh, uh, with benefit uh, sequentially, but many of us are, are doing that because they both have a survival advantage in the metastatic setting. We will get data on sequencing. We're going to get data about TDXD in the first line 
setting in the near future, probably by mid next year, et cetera. So we're very happy to have these ADCs to be able to offer uh, patients as well. So that was that was terrific um, there, um, Sarah. So I guess, let me see, what would I say in summary? You said it beautifully, you know, we've got to start first line with a CDK4-6 uh, inhibitor. We need to be seeing patients. We've got to help them. We've got to find the right dose for the right patient. We don't want to be afraid of dose um, reduction. And we want to um, have the patient come in so they know we're really committed to their um, adherence. We need um, genomic testing, especially after CDK4-6. And then we want to test it serially because we're going to be finding other mutations. We didn't even talk about activating mutations in HER2. You know, for example, there's other targetable um, mutations. Um, we're, we just need a lot of sequencing data. We look forward to additional data that's going to give us more tools. Probably it's going to turn out that Abema uh, post CDK is better than fulbestrin uh, alone. So, we're, and imlunestrin likely as well. So, we're going to have more and more uh, tools coming. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Sarah. It's been really great um, working with Sarah on this um, update on HR positive, HER2 negative breast cancer. So, thank you all. Thank you, Sarah. Great pleasure. And thank you uh, to Peerview. Goodbye now. Thank you for listening. Download materials and complete the post test for instant credit at peerview.com forward slash RRR 860. This activity is supported by an educational grant from Lilly.